the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Those words from our Lord Jesus in the upper room, John 15, 5, to introduce our program, The Voice of Truth. And this is the host of the program, Paul Fry, thanking thee for the privilege to greet you in Jesus' precious name. That name which is above every name, that name that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's interesting to observe in Scripture how often trees are used to refer to human personalities. In Ezekiel 17, 24, it says, And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree. And you know what that's referring to, that he humbles the proud and exalts the humble. Then in Isaiah 56, 3, those that do not bear fruit, spiritual fruit, are called a dry tree. There's no spiritual life. In Jude 12, the apostle Jude refers to those who expound cheap grace as trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. In other words, they might have had some semblance of fruit, but the more they hung on to cheap grace, the more whatever they did have withered. And then Isaiah 61, 3, true believers are called trees of righteousness because they imitate the righteous one. Proverbs eleven thirty, the fruit of the righteous is called a tree of life. And also in Proverbs 15, 4, a wholesome tongue is called a tree of life. Why? Because the gospel is the gospel of life. And Psalm 104, 16 also, the trees of the Lord are full of sap. Why does he say that? Full of sap because there is spiritual life. It's spiritual sap. It's spiritual life in them. And then in Luke 23, 31, the Lord referred to himself as a green tree. When he spoke to women along the way as he is being led to Mount Calvary, he said, if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry in other words, if the Lord had not come, what hope would sinners have who are looked upon as a dry tree? He referred to his green tree because he had life. He has life. He's the one who has life. I am the life. The scripture passage that our message will come from today is Psalm 92, which has been called a song for the Sabbath, meaning a psalm of worship, and emphasizes thanksgiving and praise. And we'll begin reading at verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Well, the two trees in our text need to be described so that we can grasp the spiritual truth about a true believer. Let's first look at the palm tree. The palm tree is slow of growth in contrast to the grass that grows quickly as referred to in verse 7. It says, when the wicked spring as the grass and uh, is known to endure even to several centuries. It is known for its uprightness that sends its strength upward. Some of its leaves, think of this, some of its leaves are nine feet in length and evergreen, and the tree itself reaches a hundred feet in height. And each year it bears fruit, listen to this, of palm dates that ranges from 100 to 300 pounds from one tree, even in old age. The palm tree is evergreen. One might ask, how can this be so? We see though the heavens be brass, and in the desert where the desert hate makes everything barren. You see, the tap roots of the palm tree 
go deep down into the water under the earth and feeds upon it. The spiritual application is look at verse 13. It says, um, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God because the roots of their faith go down into the one who is the living water. <clears throat> See, the child of God, when God plants, whom God plants in the house of, of the Lord, though he be treated badly and persecuted, vilified, even martyred, the child of God will bear spiritual fruit as long as God gives life. For just as a palm tree can flourish in the hottest desert and battered by the winds of the desert, flourishes because its taproots feed off the water under the earth, so the righteous flourish under their burdens because of the taproots of their faith that's rooted in the fountain of living water. You know, so many evangelists say, accept Christ as your Savior. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Listen to what it says in Colossians 2.6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, when you say that, when you say, Lord, you're, act, act, you're acknowledging his right to have complete authority over you, and that's exactly what is intended, for him to have complete authority over you. See, that's why we need repentance. We're our own authority. We're governing our own lives. But when we come to Christ, we are now governed by his authority. We address him first as Lord and then Savior. So walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, upright like the palm tree not like the dry tree of Isaiah 56, 3. Now let us look at the cedar tree to grasp the spiritual truth about this tree. It's hard to believe, but some trees can ascend to 120 feet in height. And this is hard to grasp too, but 30 to 40 feet in girth. Imagine a tree like that. See, the, tr the cedar tree is one of the strongest trees to come out of the earth. And I remember in reading Psalm 29, it says, it breaketh the cedars into pieces. Well, it's the strongest tree that comes out of the earth, and that's how strong a tornado is that can break up even a cedar tree. It's firmly rooted and has been known to live as long as 2,000 years. Solomon used cedar wood in the building of the temple because of its fragrance and its incorruptibility. Uh, we know something about that because we have a cedar closet at home and all oh, the fragrance of that cedar, it's so pleasant. And so um, these are some of the physical qualities of the cedar tree. Uh, and <coughs> um, uh, is it not appropriate that the hairs of heaven should be described as a cedar tree, an alien to things that corrupt, strong in the Lord. You know what the apostle uh, Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus before he spoke about uh, um, our conflict with our adversary? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against wickedness in high places, principalities and powers and, uh, and, uh, uh, in, in high places. And then he said, put on the armor of God, the helmet, which is the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, having our loins girt about with truth, the shield of faith, having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and the sword of the Spirit. You see, the cedar tree then shows that uh, it's, and we're to be strong in the Lord. Philippians 4.13, we can do all things through Christ who strengthen us and then give off the fragrance, the spiritual fragrance of Christ in the life we now live. You know, I believe that's one of the reasons why people are turned off against Christians. They don't see the life, the fragrance of the life of Christ in them. And just as Peter and John by their loves, lives and words prompted the Sadducees and priests 
to testify of this fragrance. Listen to Acts 4.13. Let me read this to you. Now, when they, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, saw the boldness of Peter and John, it was after they had healed the lame man at the gate beautiful, and they were, were told that, to, to stop testifying of this man and stop to be using his name. And uh, look, what, look what they said. They perceived Peter and John to be unlearned and ignorant men. But then notice, but they marveled. They marveled. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They took knowledge that they had been with Jesus and that's the way we are to reveal to others as we live, to reflect the beauty, the fragrance, the spiritual fragrance of Jesus Christ. We've talked about why the child of God is like under a palm tree and a cedar tree. What does this look like in daily living whereby the child of God can bear fruit in any age? It's all in this psalm. Look at verse, the first four verses. It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. I could go on, but for time's sake, I'm just going to speak about we, to live in humble gratitude. See, self vanishes when one has a grateful heart to the Lord. David had a heart like that when he expresses so often in Psalms chapter 100, and verses three and four, listen to what David said. Know ye not that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. That is the gratitude of David. And then the apostle Paul explains the same spirit while languishing in prison, Ephesians 5, 19. Look what it says in Ephesians 5, 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in name in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, you know, leprosy was uh, like uh, sin is uh, a type of leprosy, or leprosy is a type of sin, I should say. And when those ten lepers were healed, and <coughs> In uh, Luke chapter 17, only one of those 10 came back to give thanks and worship the Lord. And sometimes we're like the other nine that never gave thanks. I tell you something, dear ones, the more I have a thankful heart, the happier I am and the sweeter life is. A grateful heart is a singing heart. First Timothy, uh, and First Timothy uh, 6, uh, uh, 23, with, uh, 6, 6, 17, I'm sorry, where he gives us richly all things to enjoy. We have a singing heart. It's like uh, uh, a pastor called me from the Rocky Mountains. He was up there in the Rocky Mountains and his heart so caught up with the grandeur of God's creative work. He had to share it with somebody. So he called me from the Rocky Mountains. His heart was just filled with worship and he had to share it with someone. See, rejoice in God's works for all his creative work and for all his redemptive work. Then yielding to the majesty and sovereignty of God, verse 5, look what it says in verse 5. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. See, his greatness is unsearchable as we look in Psalm 145.3. How can we possibly, in words, describe a creator who can fling a thousand galaxies into space and maybe more, and each galaxy having its <coughs> army of uh, uh, planets and billions of stars. How can we describe someone so great? And to think that he had become a man to save sinners like you and I. His thoughts are unsearchable. In uh, Isaiah 55, 8, 9, the Apostle Paul, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, Isaiah says, uh, under inspiration, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. Even as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways, so are my thoughts higher than your ways and your thoughts. You see, his thoughts reveal his ways and we yield to his way over our way. And the blessed Proverbs 10, 29 says this, the way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. His thoughts are revealed in his word. 
a life of faith is governed by his word. Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews 11, 6 says <clears throat> that he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of them <coughs> that believe in him. For without faith, you cannot please God. And in the daily pursuits of life, in the spirit of yieldedness, Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service of worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the, <coughs> by the yielding of your, <coughs> by the transforming of your life, yielding to the will of God. The old is to be an example to the young, and the young is to be an example to their peers. Thirdly, resting in the Lord's sovereignty against adversaries. And we read, when the wicked spring as the grass, when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. In other words, we rest in the, in the adversaries that they have a future. They have their appointed time. Well, dear ones, you see, the nature of the soul's adversaries is life governed by the appetite of the flesh. It's governed, uh, it's a slave to the self-will. It's lawlessness that we read in verse six and seven. A brutish man knoweth not neither doth the fool understand this. He lives for his appetite. He's a slave to his self-will. When the wicked spring as the grass and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. You see, dear ones, when we, when we discuss or when we share that, what we're sharing is their goal in life is so short-lived, they're deceived and blinded by the God of this age, 2 Corinthians 4, 3, 4. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded their eyes that they believe not. You see, dear ones, at one time, we were all like that. At one time, we were the enemies of the gospel. But praise God, even when we were enemies, Christ died for our sins. Since Ezekiel 33, 11, <clears throat> we should, uh, and I want to quote that, we should use every means to communicate the gospel. Listen to what it says. As I live, saith the Lord. Ezekiel 33, 11. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their wicked way and live. Turn ye, turn ye, Turn ye, for why will you die, O house of Israel? See, there has to be that confidence to rest in the Lord. In verses 8 to 11, it says, But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn shalt thou exult like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eyes shall see my desire and mine enemies and mine ears shall hear, bear, hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. That's the confidence to rest in the Lord. We have a future. We have a future. Yes, we're to do everything we can to communicate the gospel to those who are still at war with God. But we have a future and they don't. And we're not to rejoice in that just like the Lord don't rejoice in those who do not have a future just like I just shared from Ezekiel 33, 11. There is no joy in seeing someone going to eternal judgment. We see the sovereignty of our Lord, the certainty of judgment against their soul's adversaries, the strength and the grace of the unicorn. Why does it say about the strength, the, comparing a believer to unicorn? Because we are strong in the Lord, and the unicorn was the strongest of all the animals, a very strong, strong uh, uh, animal. And that's why that uh, expression is, the, the strength of unicorn and this anointing of the blessed Holy Spirit. Rest in the Lord with patience by faith and trials lay hold upon him. The Lord is our helper in trials and always cleave to him. Acts eleven twenty three. 23. Uh, Barnabas was sent to Antioch to see if the faith was true in these people who claimed to be Christians. And when he saw that it was true, this was his message. Cleave to the Lord. All through the Old Testament, New Testament, cleave to the Lord. What does it mean to cleave to the Lord? Make him precious to your soul. Precious to your eternal soul. 
and rest in his love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, not height nor death, principalities nor angels, height and life nor death. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And be assured that we'll not be tested above that which we're able to bear. But with the temptation, God will provide a way of escape. And then 1 Peter 5.10. I love this verse. The God of all grace, who has called us unto eternal glory. After we have suffered a while, settle, strengthen, establish is in the faith, once delivered to the saints. The God of all grace, praise his name. The character reflect Christ in the age in verses 12 to 15, which we read. I'll read it again. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall still be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. And this old sinner said by grace, I would delight to count more for the kingdom of my old age than in my younger years. That's something God is, that's the grace of God in this old sinner saved by grace. You see, like the palm tree, evergreen, those in fellowship with God ever in life. This fellowship keeps the heart tender in love, not dried up as a church at Sardis in Revelation 3, 1, the cedar tree in its strength to advance in honor, power and dominion over sin and to honor our blessed Lord. And the older I get, the more I love to honor the Lord and the more I hate to see him dishonored. These trees can be said to be a type of grace under gospel influence in the life of a true believer. The gospel purifies the need to cleave and abide in Christ. The ministry of prayer is a top priority in verse 13. Those that be playing the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. It speaks about a faithful and a committed prayer life. In union with the true vine and grafted in him as one of his branches, three times the word flourish is used in that psalm. It's to reflect the character of Christ at any age. And it's the need to be dead to the world and the things that pass away. The need to be heavenly minded, dear ones, and citizens of heaven. To bear fruit at any age necessitates the drinking from the fountain of living water and feeding daily upon the bread of life, spiritually feeding and drinking upon Jesus Christ as portrayed in the gospel. This psalm can excite me because it's talking about age. And I can only encourage you, some of you, when you reach retirement age, oh, I, now I'll take it easy. Don't do that. Keep active in the Lord. Oh, these are some of my best, my best days to be active in the Lord because the more you're active in the Lord, the more you're going to bear fruit for His glory and the more you're going to enjoy life. You can't enjoy life just sitting around uh, 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 feeding upon the boob tube or going this vacation, that vacation. You can't enjoy life that way. We're a spiritual being and you have to feed your soul and to be active in the things that nourish your soul. That is, that is wisdom. You see, the palm tree fashioned by its creator is upright. The sinner born of his spirit is upright too. And notice everything after its kind. As I said, the seed of an orange tree will always bear oranges. The seed of a grape will always bear grapes. The seed of a rose will always bear roses. And if we, if the seed has been germinated in us, the word of God has been germinated in us, then there'll be the life of Christ, who is the fountain of living waters. See, as a palm tree abides with its tap roots down into the word deep down under the earth, so we reflect Christ, we must abide in him, the fountain of living waters. 1 John 2, 28 says, abide in Christ. And how are you going to abide in Christ? By being obedient to him, by letting him govern your life. That's why he said, and I, I, I do not worry of saying this, um, uh, before the, the night that the Lord was betrayed in the upper room, he said to his disciples, if you're my disciples, keep my word and you shall abide in my love, even as I uh, uh, keep my Father's commandments and abide in his love. They were going to say this. These things I said to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. That's the blessing of the spiritual life. 
to abide in him. Let me give you another. And we abide in him so we not be ashamed that he's coming. And listen, this spiritual abiding is described in Psalm 1. 1 to listen to this. This is the way to abide. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Amen. That is the guarantee to bring forth spiritual fruit. The necessity to have the right folks in life. And let me give you this. Though our outward man perish, yet our inner man is renewed day by day while we look not at the things which... Uh, I see what the old man... I completely messed it up. Let me try again. Though our outward man perish, yet our inner man is renewed day by day. And though our light affliction is but for a moment, yet it worketh in us a far more eternal weight of glory while we look, not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. First, Thess First Thessalonians, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. See, verse 15 reminds us that there's no unrighteousness in him, and we can lay hold of him as his word, a sure foundation upon which to build our lives. The Lord is true to his promises and faithful to his word. His word is quick, sharper than any two are. It's living, sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrows, and the discerner of the thoughts, the intents of our heart. See, he is a rock upon which to build our lives. We are to build and support our life upon him. He is the cleft in the rock to take shelter from the storms of this life. How awful to be a stranger to his grace. He is a rock which leads us on our upward and onward way in the life of the heavenly way. Dear ones, oh, love the Lord, serve the Lord, and rest upon the Lord and his word, and you'll bear fruit at any age. God bless you till we meet again. Praise to the Lord.